Greetings folks and welcome back to the Electromaker Show. This is your midweek roundup of all things Maker and Embedded and, well, lovely. This week we have a nice mixed show of things on funding websites, some cool projects, uh, some interesting news about the Raspberry Pi Foundation and, of course, the Mystery Box Competition. So, let's get right on with it. Hey folks, this is the first of two future Ians on this show. Uh, I was feeling increasingly ill as this show went on. Uh, I, at the time, I thought I was speaking normally, but on reflection, I looked and I saw that in some clips, I sounded a little bit like Tom Waits. So uh, that is partially why this show is a bit shorter this week, um, and partially why sometimes it may seem like uh, uh, there is some weird distortion in your speakers. It is not your speakers, it is my voice. I'm fine though, uh, it's a cold. I'll be back on form next week. And we're starting this week's show with funding website things. And here on Kickstarter, we have an 128 uh, channel input hat for the Raspberry Pi. Now, I should point out, this isn't 128 inputs you're seeing here in front of you. Um, down here is where the stuff gets really, really fun because they are stackable. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So the general idea of this Kickstarter is that interfacing with a Raspberry Pi isn't as simple as it could be because the range of voltages that things are used in interfaces is so uh, great. Um, and there's various solutions you can get for this that cost a certain amount of dollars per input. I believe that must be the way it's talked about in the industry. I'm not in the industry. Um, but this is a solution exactly for that. This is a hat that sits on top of the Pi with opto-isolated uh, inputs that allow you to take a range of voltages and monitor them on the Pi without, well, burning it to death. So the hat is called 16 Inputs for Raspberry Pi, which is a direct name. Um, but uh, as, yeah, as mentioned, it's an opto-isolated 16-channel hat for the Pi. Um, something that's quite nice as well is it has an RS4, uh, RS485 driver, which is the standard for all serial communication, um, along with, uh, of course, the Ethernet and USB ports that come with the Pi. Um, but it, uh, I've covered something quite similar to this on the show before, and these things always really interest me because um, I'm not going to be rooting around in a factory anytime soon with a Raspberry Pi trying to take signals off machines, uh, all this kind of stuff. Um, but having something in general that can take a range of input voltages for the Raspberry Pi um, is something that I, I kind of find interesting. As someone who's at the very, very beginning of their hardware hacking career, the idea of being able to plug something into the Pi without blowing it up is something that pleases me. Um, but the real winner here is the price. It only costs $40 or 34 euros to get one of these, which brings it way away from the sort of like just expensive stuff for industrial uses and industry side of things to something that anyone could afford. Um, if you're looking to get into that kind of uh, interfacing between uh, different voltages and the Raspberry Pi, this is a great way of doing it. Because remember, you don't necessarily have to be in a factory to use these things. There's a whole range of different test equipment and just general things that have uh, a wider range of voltages and having something like this might be handy, especially if, as I said before, you want to get into hardware hacking. The other cool thing is these hats or cards, whatever you want to call them, are stackable. Now, um, the base card has 16 opto-isolated opto inputs. I don't even need that many, if I'm being honest. I'm just interested in this. I don't need one opto-isolated in, uh, input, but it's interesting, you know? But when you start to stack them, these four give you 64 inputs. You can stack up to eight of them and get 128 inputs. And it all works because each card has its own device ID that can be set in hardware on the card. Anyway, um, they've already met their goal. It's just a very cool project I wanted to highlight. I will be linking it in the description of this video. Staying on Kickstarter, we have WVR, which is a tiny multi-track sample player based on the ESP32. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, I'm super excited about this project because microcontrollers, music, embedded things, you know how much I love that. Um, but this, for some reason, I'd never thought of the ESP32 as a music-making device, and it's perfect if you think about it. It's got a really powerful processor, um, it's Wi-Fi compatible, so you can talk to it, you can mesh it together. And in this case, the development board has an EMMC on it, it has a Hi-Fi DAC. Um, it's really well set up for making sounds with a microcontroller, with an ESP32. Um, it's the perfect project for me. Another thing about this I find notable is the price. It's only 30 Canadian dollars and will of course ship worldwide and it will be shipping in uh, March, so very, very soon. Um, as they say in the project, there are other audio players that do this, but they are more expensive. I'm just taking their word for that. If this interests you, uh, go and check it out. There'll be a link to it in the description. And of course, um, it goes without saying, I'm getting one of these. This is exactly my kind of thing. Hey folks, Future Ian here. Um, I noticed after the fact that this Kickstarter is actually over, um, I sent a message to the creator because I, as I said, I really want to get my hands on one of these. And if I find out how to do so, um, I will find a way of updating anyone that might be interested. Uh, maybe drop a comment on this video if you would like to know what I get as an answer. Anyway, uh, yes, on with the show. We are moving over to crowd supply now with the MDB-JS board. Now this is for integrating with vending machines, or as I like to think of them, an easy way to exchange coins for regret. Um, but all jokes aside, um, this takes old vending machines and it talks to them in a language it understands, so you can uh, connect it to a Raspberry Pi. 
Now I did say this is for the Raspberry Pi, it's actually for a range of different baseboards as it says down here, ESP32, Orange Pi, various others. Um, the main thing we're talking about here is that this uh, takes the MDB slash ICP protocol. I did a little research on this. This is basically the entire way older vending machines talk to themselves. Um, is the money real money? Should we be vending things right now? Is something paid for? All that stuff that an old vending machine needs to know. And it converts it to JSON objects, which is basically the language of the internet. Some people say it's JavaScript, but realistically, if you can move JSON around, you are winning. Um, and yeah, it brings older vending machines into the 21st century. Basically now, you can uh, uh, talk to it over the uh, over the internet, you can access it from far away. Um, presumably you could also attach an RFID reader and make uh, a coins only vending machine into one that uses uh, cards. Um, but anyway, uh, I will leave it to you to read. As you can see from the form factor of the page, it has not been launched yet. And if you would like to get information on it, there is of course the subscribe box here. Um, I'll be leaving a link to this in the description. I think I'll be coming back to this one because this one is a little too interesting to leave alone. I don't have a vending machine, strangely enough, but even so, uh, this is one of the more unique uh, little breakout boards that I've seen recently and it has piqued my interest. We're now going to look at a couple of projects from this week that caught my eye, beginning here on the Electromaker website. And that is with a project from Red Tie Projects. Uh, this is a DIY smart stray cat's house. And I love the fact that smart is in inverted commas there because this is definitely a very smart project. But really what this is, is a very nice build um, and for a very nice reason. Now, regardless of your opinions on cats and stray cats, I think we can all agree that they do deserve a decent meal and a little bit of warmth from time to time. Um, I'm not sure exactly where this video is based, but it does seem like it is very cold there. And uh, what uh, Red Tie Projects has done is taken some scrap wood and made a very nice looking little cat house, which has a heated pillow inside, a camera, some light, and also a very innovative little pulley system to send them food. Now, as well as the camera and the heated pillow inside, um, he wanted a way of putting food in uh, to the house without disturbing the stray cats. And this is where this is food transporter comes in, which uses an Arduino Uno and a little relay board, as you can see here. And that looks like a bit of an old tape player uh, that was uh, being pulled together. And this old PC power supply, as you can see, this is a proper from scratch junk build with whatever he had lying around. That's one of the things I love about this so much. So as you can see, the house is a real success. It looks wonderful. Um, there are some very happily looking fed cats here uh, that do get a little bit shocked when the food starts moving by itself. Um, but this is just a lovely project. It seems like it was made with whatever he had lying around the place at the time. And uh, yeah, just what a wonderful thing. Look at it, it's great. Moving on to a DIY intruder alert system that uses the Raspberry Pi Pico and the Raspberry Pi 4. Now this is a fantastically in-depth project which uses a motion sensor with the Raspberry Pi Pico to detect motion. It uses that to wake up the Raspberry Pi and the camera on the Raspberry Pi will take an image of the intruder, compare it to a face using a facial recognition script in OpenCV and if it detects a stranger it will send you a notification on your smartphone via if this then that. And if me describing it to you seemed hard to follow, do not worry, the tutorial is very easy to follow. It breaks it down step by step, starting with how you can wire the sensor to an LED. And later on, this LED turning on and off is the way that the uh, Raspberry Pi 4 is going to be triggered to turn on. This project is by Carlo Grisafi, by the way, and I apologize if I've mispronounced your name. Um, and uh, it goes on, as well as telling you this, as I've just mentioned, it goes on to tell you how to install OpenCV, how to train it, um, how to uh, trigger a web hook and uh, get IFTTT to notify you if the a, uh, unusual or intruder's face is detected. Um, and then, of course, how to turn the Pi on and off again by shorting GPIO pins 5 and 6. Um, uh, Carlo does mention, by the way, that this, this is probably not the best way to turn the Pi on and off and wants to implement a better solution and asks for uh, comments or raising issues on GitHub. If any of you would like to do that, he has linked to his GitHub page here. Unfortunately, that does 404, but if you go to the base page um, of his GitHub um, and just look for repositories, it's R, uh, rpi4 pico person detection. Um, I'm guessing that since he made this tutorial, he has changed the name of the uh, repository. Um, either way, this is a fantastic project. I'll leave a link to it in the description. Um, yeah, fantastic work, Carlo. I love this. Now, I've mentioned Ben Everard's PIO tutorials before. That is the Raspberry Pi Pico uh, input and output system that has its own kind of special assembly language that I've dabbled with a little bit. Um, and uh, I think the previous tutorial uh, I showed was just a very simple how to turn an LED on and off using PIO. Um, and I wasn't going to necessarily talk about it again, but now we've put one out as to how you can make a PWM synthesizer using the Raspberry Pi Pico's PIO registers. Uh, yeah, how could I not feature this? 
So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Just go and read Ben's tutorials there. A fantastic introduction to PIO, um, a fantastic introduction to how you can mix this PIO assembly with your Python code. Um, and this one specifically is how to make a square wave PWM synthesizer, which I find very interesting. Uh, you don't need any special equipment to do this. You can basically run this straight out of a GPIO of the Pi. You probably want to use a resistor to do that. Ah, which uh, is right here. Of course he thought of that. Um, yeah. Head over there, read this, read all of the things about PIO, fantastic tutorials, really looking forward to uh, getting into this one myself. And it is time for the mystery box competition. As you can see, there is a box called mystery box and inside it, there are many mystery items. Some of them might be the newest and coolest microcontrollers in the world. Some of them might be a bit older. Some of the things in here might just be shields for microcontrollers that you do not own and maybe don't exist anymore. The whole point of it being a mystery box competition is that you might win something that is mysteriously useless. Um, just a quick reminder that these are all provided by the fine people at Mauser Electronics. Thank you, Mauser. Um, but yes, let's just get on with it, shall we? I shall rummage, I shall grab, I shall, I shall get a rummagey grabby. What do we have? It's a bag and a box. A box and a bag. Mini wireless key. Oh, okay. This is a miniature wireless keyboard. The very handy thing to have if you're ever working with Raspberry Pis and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just going to have a quick nosy inside the box, as is my wont. And uh, let's see. So yes, as the box says, this is one of those tiny little wireless keyboards that uses RF uh, to talk to the computer. It also has a laser pointer in it, I think, as it has a class two laser product warning on the bag. But this is so beautifully packed, I don't want to crack it open. So let me see if I can find you an image online. And here it is. It is, as you can see, a tiny little keyboard with a touchpad, which is nice, and a laser pointer, um, which is interesting. But I guess the whole point of this is, as well as maybe rigging it up to your Raspberry Pi the first time you boot it and turn it on and you just want a quick way to interface with it, uh, the idea is this could be used in business meetings to point at the things and the things. Either way, one of you will be winning it and we have our prize. Let's choose a prize winner. And our winner this week is Dwight Robinson, whose comment I think refers to the NVIDIA uh, automatic dog treat feeder that we uh, had in the show last week. If you remember, um, this is a, a, a AI that can tell whether the dog is sitting down or standing up and uh, dispensing treats if it is sitting down. Although remember, whether standing up or sitting down, they are all good dogs. So congratulations, Dwight. We'll be in touch with you as to how we can get this out to you. And I just want to give a quick shout out to everyone who watches the videos each week and leaves comments on the, uh, on the videos. I know I don't reply to absolutely everybody. Um, I... As I've mentioned many times before, time is not something that I have as a luxury, but I do read all of the comments uh, when I'm on my phone, um, and it does really make me happy that so many of you are interested in this show. Um, I, obviously, this is still very near the beginning for us, but for me, it's a great feeling to know that what I'm doing is enjoyed by people. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for that. Anyway, far too much waffling from me. Let's get on with the show. And finally this week, a little bit of news and a new board that I thought was interesting we could take a look at. But first, the news is from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. They are now officially selling IQ Audio products. Now, I'm aware this show has been quite audio heavy so far, and I'm not sorry. Um, IQ Audio make fantastic high fidelity DACs for the Raspberry Pi. They've actually been around for a while, five or six years, I think. Um, I think it was about three years ago I first became aware of them. I can't remember if it was on Kickstarter or whether someone just linked it to me. Um, but they're basically Raspberry Pi hats that give you full uh, high quality audio outputs. Um, and now Raspberry Pi, are uh, they've bought them and will be officially selling them in the Raspberry Pi shop. Now, I think this is fantastic news. These are serious high fidelity audio products. Um, and yeah, this is just, this kind of completes the uh, arc for Pi for me at the minute. Um, Raspberry Pi Foundation putting out the Pi Pico is obviously super exciting for me, um, but the fact that um, they're going to be involved in the future of IQ Audio means that, as far as I'm concerned, that's the Raspberry Pi Foundation saying, yes, we will be considering um, high audio, high quality audio on the Raspberry Pi going forward, um, which is fantastic. This is great news. Um, so yes, they're already available from the Raspberry Pi shop at various prices, various setups. Um, they're, yeah, they're just fantastic. I'm just very, very happy that this is a thing. Now, I'm familiar with the DAC Plus and DAC Pro. Um, these are high, uh, high quality digital audio converters that take your Raspberry Pi sound and then you can feed it into an amplifier and then you can feed that into speakers. The uh, DigiAmp Plus is awesome because it has the amplifier built in. It can power quite absurdly high. Is it 40 watts per channel? No, 30, 35 watts per channel, which is still pretty decent. Um, pretty big speakers you can run from just a Raspberry Pi and a hat. This is everything you need to make a completely programmable digital audio system. You can probably tell I'm quite excited about that. And they do um, a zero board as well, uh, which is for the Raspberry Pi Zero. Um, but the main point of this is that these boards are available now from the Raspberry Pi website. If you want to get one, head to the Raspberry Pi shop and they will be there. 
Just before moving on, I wanted to remind you briefly that the Electromaker website does have a store um, and it stocks a lot of Raspberry Pi stuff. It stocks stuff from a load of different providers. Um, now, we don't like to plug the store too hard on the show. That doesn't really fit the vibe. I don't really like the idea of this becoming one big advert. But by the same token, I can't deny the fact that anything you buy from the Electromaker store will directly support this show. It's one of the easiest ways you can support us other than, of course, liking and all the YouTube silliness. Um, but yeah, I don't want this to become a big advert, just a quick reminder that it exists. Um, but yeah, let's get on with the show. We're going to close out this week's show by very briefly looking at the ESP32 Pico V3 Zero development kit. Um, now, it's named after the system on module of the same name, which is interestingly a collaboration between Amazon and Espressive. Um, I remember thinking when it was announced last year that it was a kind of interesting pairing, but by the same token, it makes sense. I mean, Amazon has such a dominant force online, um, and Alexa is pretty much the dominant... Uh, smart home uh, device in terms of a uh, digital assistant. If you're going to bring out a smart home device, you want it to work with Alexa, and this seems like a very good way of making it do so. Now, the Alexa Connect kit isn't something that I have any hands-on experience with it, but um, uh, Amazon has a quick explainer here. It's a managed service that makes it easy to integrate Alexa into your product. With uh, ACK, you don't need to write an Alexa skill uh, or manage a cloud service. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, instead, you integrate your ACK module into your product and pay a one-time fixed cost. So presumably that fixed cost is something that you need to pay at the start of development to, for testing. Um, but then again, if you're working in the industry, that's not something that's going to bother you at all. Um, but uh, rather than go through every single part of this, which I will probably get wrong anyway, um, I will just say, go and read this fantastically detailed article on CNX software. As always, it is a fantastic article. Um, the one thing you should be aware of that I will mention is that you need a US-based Amazon developer account in order to use these. So that counts out quite a lot of people. Um, it seems like you can get the hardware uh, all around the world, but you need a US-based Amazon developer account. Why? Well, Amazon are going to Amazon a bit. The fact that this is unique hardware is the real reason that I'm featuring it on the show. Um, the way it works, the fact that it works with the Arduino Zero is interesting, um, and the fact that, uh, yeah, Amazon and Espresso have made something that works specifically with Amazon services. I don't really have an opinion about it, but I do find it interesting. Um, if you do have an opinion, I would love to hear it. Uh, but at the end of the day, Espresso also still make the ESP8266 chips, the ESP32 chips, um, all the things that we're going to play with and do whatever the hell we want with forever. Um, but yeah, if you do want to read more about this, I will leave a link to the article in the description of this video. So that was our show for this week. Thank you so much for joining me. As always, if you are up to anything interesting, please do let me know in the comment section below. And of course, that will enter you into the mystery box competition. And if you see anything cool that you think I may have missed in the last week, do let me know. I might cover it on next week's show. Who knows? But anyway, for now, I hope you have a productive and safe and happy week. And I'll see you in the next show.